Green Jolly Green, this is Sandy Six. Uh, Roger Jolly's, uh, where are you at? I'm actually going to have to make this quick because the uh, uh, 405 is about 1,600 pounds of gas total. I guess uh, the both survivors are pretty bad shape. I'm going to start off yeah. by having you tell me your name. So, my and name is Stan Nelson. I retired from the Air Force as a E-8 senior master sergeant in uh, September of 1980. And then I went to, taught at Parks College for two semesters and ended up uh, being offered a job in Florida, American Airlines training with helicopter uh, systems. So. I pretty much stayed in aviation after I retired from the Air Force. Okay. And um, yeah, ended up on the Gulf Coast, offshore oil um, transportation. Our company uh, serviced the oil platforms that had contracts with it, uh, Chevron, Exxon, and that, with uh, transporting people back and forth and um, equipment, vital equipment, the one they needed if something broke down on the oil rig. And I worked at that for, uh, I was a senior training instructor with them. But I also worked in the safety office, uh, air logistics. And um, we investigated accidents that, of, of our aircraft in the Gulf Coast out there. That they, uh, And there were a lot, of, I mean, there were the oil platforms out there is a hazardous work area where, you know, having to haul people uh, back to the hospitals on land for uh, because of injuries they sustained out there. And, had a couple of blowout one time where they had to go out there and get get the people off the water. It was during the night, you know, and, and of course hurricane evacuations and stuff like that. So uh, I worked at that for till 1986, and then the oil crunch came along, and companies said, "Well, don't make any capital investments, you know, buying a house or a car and then because you you may not have a job, you know." And so. Uh, friend of mine called me up there who I work with in Florida and he said, hey, uh, PSA is hiring, why don't you send your resume out there, you know, so I updated my resume and sent it out to him and they called me and said uh, they wanted to fly me out there for an interview, That that's in San Diego, and so I went out there and uh, interviewed with them and um, went back home, they said they'd give me a call on that, you know, and about a week and a half later they called and said, uh, you know, we'd want you to come to work for us and uh, they uh, said we'll have a moving van in front of your house <laughs> I give a day and, you know it was we were gone we, we left in uh, August of uh, 86 and went to San Diego worked there six years and then uh, they had to have a near to four had too many foremen out there so they sent me to uh, Charlotte and that's how I ended up there working until I retired from US Airways and uh, you know, we lived there for about oh, 11 years after that, and then we uh, moved to uh, here to Maryville, Tennessee. So it's a nice place to live, isn't it? It is. It's a nice area. So, Stan, why don't you lead me through, how did you wind up in the Air Force? How did you wind up in rescue helicopters? And uh, how did you ultimately wind up in, uh, I believe you were in NKP, correct? Uh, Udorn. Udorn. We did TDY at the NKP. All right. Yeah. Well, I, in 1906, I graduated high school in 59. I worked at a lumber yard uh, that summer and that fall, and then uh, they're building an elevator in my hometown, and I was delivering construction material to that elevator, and a friend of mine was one of the construction workers there. And the week before that, it was like 40 above, and then that, that week was 30 some below zero. And so we, him and I are complaining to each other about how cold it was. We, we need to go someplace warmer. And I said, well, let's go to Texas. And he said, what are you going to do in Texas? I said, well, I'll go in the Air Force. You know, and next day we were down seeing our recruiter and and uh, walked by the Navy. They tried to recruit us, Marines and Armies. And all. we already got our mind made up. We're going to Texas. And so we ended up uh, leaving about uh, January 5th, I think it was. And... Uh, Got to uh, Lackland Air Force Base, had a month of basic training there. And then uh, at the end of that basic training, I got my, um, they assigned me to helicopters along with about four or five other guys in my class. And uh, we went to Shepherd Air Force Base 
I started helicopter school at the end of February, 1st of March, and that lasted until second week in July, I think it was. And I had to sit there and wait for my all my all my whole class left. They got their assignments, and I'm still I hadn't had a, didn't have an assignment yet, you know. So they uh, finally get it in this Goodfellow Air Force Base in the 11th 10th Balloon Activity Squadron. I said, Well, hey, I'm in helicopter. What am I doing on balloons? Well, I got down there and found out it's recovering of high altitude air samples uh, for the Atomic Energy Commission. We had. Uh, eight missions a month, four dry and four wet. And uh, summertime they went west out into West Texas and uh, New Mexico. And uh, wintertime they went uh, east to Louisiana, East Texas. Missouri. While they were doing that, they were measuring the particles of yeah, the they radiation. Were, yeah, the, the, their, their wet sampling was actually pulling air into a collection bag and then pumping that into an armored vessel so it wouldn't rupture on the landing. And that air was pumped into uh, with high with high pressure uh, compressors into these um, big nitrogen steel uh, oxygen bottles, and it would fill three of those up. And uh, those emissions, we usually had to sit on the ground for two, three, sometimes four hours, while the air was being pumped from the uh, vessel into the uh, bottles. And the air, the the dry samples, uh, that. That burst at altitude and it just floated down by parachute. We picked the equipment up and left, so that was didn't take as long to do that. I was there five years. Didn't they think I was ever going to leave West Texas? <laughs> and then I get an assignment to Marone Air Base in Spain, which was a LBR H 43s, and uh, there were no fighters on that base. It was a transit base where they came and went. Uh, when they when they moved fighters from the states, they landed them at Marone. They spent the night there, and then they would go on to either Italy or Germany or wherever they were being assigned to. And same, but same for uh, aircraft going back. They stopped at Marone, and and because it was probably a, oh six hour flight across the Atlantic, because they refueled and you know going back. And so anyway, I was there. I was there about six months, and then we had that B fifty two that collided with the. Uh, KC-135 and uh, dropped four H-bombs. Um, That's pretty big news at the time. Oh, I mean, yeah, that yeah. That rocked the world. Yeah, January 66, and uh, it was, yeah, it was huge. And um, we sent one of our helicopters over there. You know, they were looking for the remains of the bombs that landed on land, and three of them landed on land and, you know, broke open. And so there was alpha or alpha contamination around there, and, or beta, I should say. And then the other balloon, the other bomb floated out into the Mediterranean because the parachute deployed on it. And uh, the bombs weighed about 2,300 pounds, and they were about, I don't know, 12 feet, 11, 12 feet long. Okay. About maybe 18 inches, 24 inches in diameter. That was your beginning in rescue, wasn't it, when you transitioned? Well, I, I was in, I ended up in rescue, uh, while I was in the balloon outfit, because that that was originally under headquarters command, then they assigned it to Air Weather Service, and then they split that unit in two. The recovery people were in Air Weather Service, and the recovery people were the, the helicopter operators were came under rescue. And that was in summer of '63, and that's where my rescue time and rescue started, and went to Spain in, in rescue. Uh, came back from Spain uh, to a parent Air Force Base to another LBR unit. And then I had an assignment to Thompson Hoot on H-43s. And there was a colonel that came through uh, parent Air from one of our Central Command headquarters. That was, that was at Richard Bauer, Missouri. He said they were looking for uh, helicopter flight engineers. And so he put my name in for it. And... I guess about two weeks later, I'd been to Minnesota. My 10th high school reunion came back, and I had a, a TDY orders to go to Eglin Air Force Base. And that's where we received our uh, training to that air, that helicopter. Which helicopter was a, that? The H-53. The H-53. Yeah. In fact, we came up here to Knoxville for a week to do mountain training with, with that class. And uh, we... Uh, 
you know, receive training and weight and balance total data, which is takeoff and landing data, um, fuel management, uh, gunnery, water hoist, uh, cargo sling work, all that stuff. We, we had to be trained on that and compute. Each time we had to do the, uh, do the, do the hoist training or the cargo sling, we'd have to compute the power. Uh, you know, the, the engineers did that instead of the pilots because that changed during the, during the missions. So, uh, now that changes also with your uh, weather conditions as far as your barometric pressure. Yeah, your uh, yeah your power your power available. Um, that's how much the engine can the both engines can put out. Uh, the B models were limited because those engines were three thousand horses apiece. The C model had almost four thousand horsepower, another thousand horsepower more. So, we didn't have the performance problems with the C model that you had with the B model. And the B models were the initial ones, H-53s that went to uh, Thailand. There were five of them, and um, they they flew out of Udorn. And you were, uh, what unit were you in while you were there? I was in the 40th Aerospace Rescue and Recovery Squadron. Okay. And then it was under third group, which is at Tonsonut. And then Tons the third group was under the 41st wing at Hickam. Now, were they calling them the Jolly Greens at that time? Oh, yes. Yeah, they were. In fact, we were called the Super Jollies because the, the original Jollies were the HH3s. Mm -hmm. And then when the H-53s came over there, they just, to differentiate them, they, they just said they're Super Jollies. I know that pilots referred to you as buffs. Yeah. Big, ugly fellows, I believe, is something <laughs> big, like that. Big, ugly, friendly fellows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, that was a, the B fifty two was also called that. <laughs> but yeah, they uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, how should I say the the H threes I call them the net noise, which net noise in Thai means small, you know. So they, they when they said net noise, you were, you knew what they were talking about. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So, but the but the original uh, the original jollies over there were the H threes, and they didn't have refueling probes on them. They had to land up in Laos and hand pump fuel from a 55 gallon oh. drums into uh, into the aircraft, you know. So uh, when that, the air refueling came along, that really gave him uh, uh, more range in a shorter amount of time. I believe when I was reading um, General General Adderholt's book, he was talking about when he got there, the plan was to set up. But they were Lima sites where they yeah, refueled. Sites, yeah. mm -hmm. So he set up all those sites yeah. knowing that those aircraft could not get from point A yes. to B or C without right. refueling. In fact, the original helicopters in Southeast Asia, the original Air Force rescue helicopters were H-43s. And they were TDY. They took they took people on the, that were experienced on H-43s and they sent them over their TDY for a like six months or something like that. That was the little K-Max. Yeah, K yeah, Cayman. Uh, yeah, the little Cayman. Yeah. And uh, that, was, that was a local base rescue helicopter. They didn't have the range. So what they did to extend the range is they had a 55-gallon drum in the cabin, which kind of filled up half that cabin back there. And they would, as the fuel drained out of that, once, once that barrel was empty, they'd, they'd kick it overboard. Because the clamshell doors on the back of the helicopter, they took them off. And all there was was a net back there. And of course, the, the engineer, the flight mechanic, wore a gunner's belt you know, back there. Mm -hmm. But it was difficult to do a Stokes letter pickup in it. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that was the helicopter that uh, Pitsenbarger yes. was. Yes. Uh, yeah. Out of uh, the, the he, one he, the Medal yeah, of Honor. Yeah, he was out of Tonsonu, yeah. He awarded the Medal of Honor, yes. Yes, yeah. Um, and then they came out with the F Model H-43, which had more armor plating on it and self-sealing fuel tanks, and they, they made it more combat-worthy, but it still didn't have much range, you know. And then when the H-3s came along, uh, they could go into North Vietnam and uh, stay airborne for longer periods of time, but then they had to come back and refuel in other words, if they were they were up there and they were being held in a in an orbit somewhere safe, while they prepped the area for the pilot to be picked up, uh, if that was an extended period of time, they'd have to fly back into uh, Lima Site 36 in, in Laos to refuel, and then they take off again. You know, and then when the air when the uh, 
air refueling came along, that, you know, they didn't have to do that anymore. So when we were talking, uh, you and I sat down earlier and chatted, we were talking about a few missions that were you that you were on. Yeah. Can we go into a few of those and, and discuss some yeah. of those a little bit and talk about the experience? What was your job on the aircraft? Well, first, yeah, my job was the was kind of threefold. I had I did the pre-flight of the helicopter. Yeah, I prepped the weight and balance, prepped the total data, takeoff and landing data, and I was a, a number two gunner as well as a hoist operator. And then during cargo sling missions, I was the one in the cabin uh, giving directions to the pilot. Um, when you when the hoist operator on the H-53, when, when you came in, he the guy would pop a smoke. The pilot would lose sight of that guy. That'd be the survivor on the ground. Yeah, he would lose sight of that guy. So what? about 200 or 300 feet out, I'd go hop mic. We had a little switch that we'd pop the switch up and... We could talk without having pressing an intercom button, and I would just give him a steady um, stream of directions. You know, the distance to him, and and uh, and, and I was as I was doing that, I was lowering the ho- I would lower the hoist down, so the hoist was going down while I was while we were approaching. And the idea was to get the hoist on the ground right as it got to the guy, instead of dragging it through trees and stuff like that. So, uh, but uh, the um, the hoist operation, uh, depending on the, the out of hover height, the my most of, most of mine were seventy five to hundred feet, but there were times that they went over two hundred and they used every bit of cable up. I was wondering how much cable was on the aircraft. Two hundred and forty five feet of cable, and and when you reached that limit, the hoist stopped. And, and the, the reason you would have to be at that altitude, people don't understand those jungles, the triple canopy jungles. Yes. Were incredibly tall. Those yeah. trees were. They were phenomenal. 250 to 300 feet high, especially on the side of a, a side of a steep uh, uh, mountain side. You know where it was really a really steep, and uh, then they there were times when they lowered the. When I was at Da Nang, one of them lowered it into the trees to get the guy out. And they got him out, but we had to change all the blades and inspect the drivetrain and all that and. Uh, so he actually lowered the aircraft into yeah, the trees, well, yeah, settled into the yeah, trees. Yeah, the rotor blades were chopping through tops of trees, and debris was flying all over. Oh, was but, he flying an HH-53? Pardon? Was that an H-53? Uh, that yeah, was I think H, some H-3s did that, too. That that had to just... <laughs> that's a monster aircraft. It must have just chewed stuff up for oh, miles yeah. and thrown it forever. But it, you know, it, it would rip... The, the, the tip caps on the H-53 were... The removable tip caps were about 12 to 14 inches long, and it would just rip them up, you know. And and, uh, and then, of course, when you're flying back, if you got going too fast, the aircraft would really start to shake, you know. So they have to they'd have to pick an airspeed where the vibration aircraft vibration caused by the damaged rotor blades would, uh, you know, could be uh, uh, safely safely uh, flown at. Yeah. I knew a Chinook pilot that um, when he would take rounds, he, he'd get that vibration. Mm-hmm. He carried an AK in the aircraft with him, and he would go out and he'd pace off the distance, mm-hmm. and he would go and shoot another round through the other oh, rotor oh, to yeah. balance it to out until he got back. Yeah. Well, there were, you know, now, originally over there on some of the H3s, that uh, they carried this, um, duct tape, and they'd, they'd wrap they wrap the blade where the holes were, the damage was with duct tape, and make it fly a little bit smoother. You know. I wonder if that's where the two hundred mile an hour tape. Yeah, they, came we from. we in the airline industry we use six hundred mile an hour tape. Yeah. And it would, yeah, it would, uh, you know, if you punched a hole in the engine cowling or something like that, it wasn't structural. Six hundred mile an hour tape, and you'd write it up and send it to work and work load control, and they'd program it for repair at a wow. repair station. You know, but my. Uh, my first mission there, I was in country, um, let's see, a little over a month, and I was high bird that day. Could you explain high bird and low bird yeah, for folks? There, we always traveled in two helicopters and two A1s that, on orbits and like that, but on this particular day, we took off. We got scrambled because we were north alert, and um, 
my HOIC, he was on the low bird. And um, we got up there and we were orbiting and then we had to refuel. And when, when the low bird, the low bird is the first one to go in to, to make the rescue. The high bird is there in case something goes wrong where he, they have to go in there with the high bird to pick up the crew. And um, I don't think people understand um, how important it was to have that second bird because oh, yeah. quite often that first helicopter would get shot up really yeah. bad and you would have to abort the rescue of the person on the ground right. to actually rescue the... Right, the, the, and that happened the, to one of our... That, that, that happened in 68, um, I think it was. Uh, one of the B Model H 53s was put down uh, near Chapone and uh, the, the hybrid came in and picked the crew up and then the A1s blew the aircraft up, you know, instead yep. of leaving it there for the enemy. And yep. But so the yeah the hybrid there, in, but in this case on that day when the so back to your mission. I'm when sorry. The, when the detroit. low bird uh, when he lost second stage tail rotor coming off the tanker, he lost hydraulics. The, the servo was two stage. He lost half the stage, and so um, we became low bird, and then uh, we orbited up there waiting for the replacement hybrid. So we, uh, when the hybrid got up there and the A1s were working that area, it was on the North Vietnamese border. Uh, we call it the fish's mouth, the Bartholomew Pass. And uh, the guy, F4 went in, uh, his call sign was Banyan 03. And uh, the front seater went in with the airplane. The back seater got blown out of the airplane and, and he landed on a upslope on a karst. Karst is a limestone outcropping zero. Some, this one looked like it's about eight, nine hundred feet high, straight vertical wall of uh, going straight up. But the, the down the, uh, the base of that karst was a kind of a forty-five degree downslope, but it was covered with jungle foliage and vegetation. And uh, we had to, we came we went north of Route Seven area because uh, Route Seven is the road that comes out of Bartholomew Pass from North Vietnam and goes into Northern Laos. So we, we passed in an area, we passed, uh, crossed over Route 7 in an area that was deemed safe by the Sandies. Then we went around north and we headed east and came back in, uh, crossed over Route 7 again to get to this, this guy that was on the ground. And uh, when we came up to him, we, fa we faced the car, so I mean, he pulled straight up. I, and I couldn't see the smoke. There was no smoke at all. And uh, he hovered there for maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds. And then he did a pedal turn to the left. So now instead of facing the south, we were facing east. And the car was on my side of the helicopter. And, and as soon as we turned that 90 degrees, ground fire erupted from four to five o'clock position off our tail level. They were right level with us. And then there was a bunch of, uh, some guys on the ground that were shooting straight up at us. And he, the pilot was trying to tell us to get out of there. The survivor on the ground Yeah, was. the survivor, he threw his smoke downhill. And that's why we want the reason we didn't see it. He threw it down from him. And uh, the, our tail gunner, he uh, took two rounds through the side of the fuselage and hit him in a parachute and it kind of knocked him, knocked him to his right, which was the minigun then pointed to where the ground fire was coming from and he opened up uh, two and four thousand rate and uh, he was just, imagine a sickle going through a hay field, he was just, just cutting the brush down like a sickle. And uh, there were tracers, red and green, ours were red, theirs were green coming up through the rotor blades and this, everything seemed like it was in slow motion. You know, and, and the, the, mini, the rear minigun was going, the cabin filled with smoke from the gun, from the gunfire. And uh, I'm leaning out the Dutch, uh, leaning out the door. I got the hoist down just right over the, right over the foliage. And I didn't want to put it in there because then I'd lose sight of it and no telling who would grab a hold of it, you know, so I, I was waiting to see that red smoke and lower that to the smoke, you know, and, and uh, I couldn't see him. And so I had him, I, I directed the pilot to, to back the helicopter up. And all the while I'm looking out, and then I told him I moved to the left. 
And then I told him, you know, didn't see anything and moved back forward again. And then we moved back to the right again. And all this time they're shooting at us. And so my AC told the number one PJ, he said, get over there and help him see if you can see that smoke, you know. And so again, we had him back up, went through the same routine. And he said, we told him, he said, we don't see any smoke at all down there. And uh, so he kind of just rolled off the side of the, the up the uh, the hover area there and, and headed back north across Route Seven. A ones went with us because uh, one of them was flying, and then we got to eight thousand feet and he he kind of flew around underneath us and off to the side. And our high bird was had picked us up. He was following us real close. He was uh, and. Uh, he, uh, we, co you know, couldn't use the fuel in the drop tanks because you got to pressurize the drop tanks and with holes in them, they wouldn't pressurize. So I couldn't use the fuel in the drop tanks. I just had what was in the mains. And um, he, the AC called for a tanker and uh, probably within about 10 or 15 minutes, the tanker pulled up beside it, underneath us and below us. And, we made a run at the tanker. He hit the hose the first time, and I told him, I said, I'm only going to fill the mains up. And um, when, he, when the fuel started flowing, all the lights lit up. There's a refueling panel down here by my knee, and all the lights lit up, and I, I, had, the, I had the drop tank shut off. But they were filling anyway. It didn't matter, you know. And so uh, about that time, I heard this. One of the crew members in the back, boy, he was screaming back there, and I turned around look back in the cabin and I couldn't see him. The whole cabin was filled with uh, atomized jet fuel, you know, and, and we couldn't close the ramp because the hydraulic lines back there got shot out. So it's just sucking through the yeah, aircraft. Yeah, it's, it's pulling the, 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 the low pressure behind the helicopter, sucking that, what he, the A1 call, he says, you got a rooster tail coming out of your right drop tank. And it was going up through the rotor blades you know, getting atomized. In fact, uh, the aircraft commander of the Highbird, he, when he saw all that fuel just spewing out from the back, he moved off to, he moved out about another, probably a quarter mile away because he expected us to blow up. How far was your position in the aircraft from the... About uh, 30, 35 feet from the, to the back of the ramp was Where the guy feet. was screaming. So you couldn't see 35 no, feet. No, I couldn't. It was, the whole cabin was just filled with the atomized jet fuel, you know. Wow. And, and it was one spark, and I mean, that thing would have just exploded. And uh, so uh, I told him, I said, have the tanker shut the fuel off. Because we, we, we got up to about 1,000 pounds in each main tank. They held 2,000, you know. So uh, the tanker shut the fuel off, and then the fuel dissipated. And, and uh, when the fuel dropped down to about 400 to 500 pounds again, we we had them fill it back up again, you know, and we stayed hooked to the tanker for about 40, 45 minutes until we got to Lima site uh, 20 alternate. And we landed there and taxied in and got, you know, finally shut down and we uh, counted 57 holes, uh, holes through the rotor blades and the fuel was still spewing out of the drop tanks, but not, the mains were self-sealing. But, but the drop tanks weren't, they, they were filled with foam, but. So this is your first mission? Yeah, my first, yeah, my first, how should I say it? Uh, I got my feet wet, so to speak. Got my feet wet with jet fuel. Yeah. Um, and so. Then we, uh, the aircraft commander, we were looking the bird over and, and I looked above the ramp and there's a wire bundle back there, about that big around, it was just sliced right in half. And I, I, just, I told him, I said, well, you look there, he looks up, turn it's just white yeah so I think the good Lord was looking after us did you have any thoughts about what's the rest of my tour going to be like if this yeah. is day one well when that when that MIG shot the, the 28th of January which was before this when that MIG shot that one of our helicopters down we lost the whole crew I said man I, I don't know if I'm going to survive a year you know and um and then in uh, March, we had a uh, mission. That was a wolf. wolf uh, Before we go to the next yeah. one, your, uh, how did they, did they ever recover that pilot yes, on that mission? Yes, uh, our high bird, uh, 
became low bird. We got another high bird up there, and then about after dark, mm-hmm. he went in there and uh, made the rescue, picked the guy up. And, uh, was it uneventful, or did they run through a similar? Pretty much system? uneventful. There, there were one of the A ones had put a rocket nearby, and they thought it was a mortar, a mortar or something that went off, but it wasn't. And, and uh, next morning, the pilot that they rescued, uh, his guy named Dotson, he, uh, you know, briefed us. He asked who was who was on that first bird there, and you know, we raised our hands, and, and he says, uh, "You guys pretty well wiped out everybody up there." He says because. Uh, after you left, he said, uh, they uh, picked up the weapons of all those that were killed and left me up there by myself. And that was, we went in about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so this was around 7, because the sun had already gone down, you know, so. And uh, I found out later on that a year later, he got shot down again. And he got rescued again by the 40th, <laughs> so. So he owes a lot of people a lot of drinks. Oh, yeah. I, I hear that uh, when you guys run into pilots still, you know, they, yeah, they, they, they're very they gracious. Out, yeah. And then when they find out you were a jolly, they, uh, you're treated pretty well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's not speak. a bad way to earn a living. <laughs> no. So on to your next mission. I'm sorry, I didn't mean, yeah. I wanted to just wrap that up. Yeah, we had a, uh, an NKP when it was Channel 89. That was a Tacan channel. Each base had a different number, which was a TACAN channel. And they, they, off that TACAN channel, that, that's what was used for navigation purposes, the, the distance and the, and the heading. Well, when we came in and saw the 08, um, 09060089, we knew it was a bad area. I mean, you just look at those numbers up there. That meant uh, zero nine zero degrees for sixty miles out of Channel eighty nine, which was NKP, straight east, sixty miles. And where did that take you, roughly? We're, we're right in the McGee Pass. Right, I was going right, to say, right I was thinking McGeeha it was McGee Pass. Pass. Yeah. So Could you bad. tell folks what McGee Pass was like from your perspective? Well, yeah, McGee Pass was a it, it was it was it was the entrance to the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos for one thing. And it was a series of trails, but on each side of the, each side of McGee Pass were these high karst outcroppings that were filled with caves and um, anti-aircraft guns. Uh, it was more than one trail. It was a, it was a series of trails, you know. So we they they blow up this trail, but they'd still have these trails over here, and they'd repair these trails, you know. And so it was a major cho- choke point. Yeah. In the Ho Chi Minh Trail. But it was confined by some horrific terrain. Those karsts. Yeah. yeah. One of the gentlemen that was an A1 pilot uh, that was performing a rescue there said uh, during his SAR it was like flying an air show in the Rose Bowl. He said yeah, it was that tight. Oh yeah, yeah, and it was. You, we had, we had helicopters come back. They had holes from the right side to the left, from the left side to the right, from the front to the back, from the bottom up. You know, so it was like it was like going through a gauntlet. And, uh, you know, there were times when they would come in, you know, do a spiraling descent into the, into the, uh, loca- the survivor's location, you know. And generally they'd try to hide you behind a karst and then when, they, when you came in, you, you came in fast and low using the terrain as, as, as a cover, but once you got over where the survivor was, you, you were out in the open, you know. And there was a there was a little river that, that ran through there and on Boxer Two Two and one landed on one side of the river and one on the other side of the river. Well, you weren't there for that one. No, I wasn't. I got there after that. But okay. Wolf Zero Six was in the same place. Mm-hmm. And um, after uh, two days, they finally picked the guy up. And uh, again, I think it was the back seat of the pilot. Uh, one of the crew members that was uh, went in. Um, the, the hoist operator on that one helicopter that made it in there, he uh, saw the one guy get captured, but he never showed up on any POW uh, role, you know, so the, they, they have to assume that he was uh, executed or died in, 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 you know, being held as a prisoner, mm-hmm. you know. So, yeah, that, uh, McGee Pass, 
And there was another pan, the Bangkok I was a Bonalo Boy Ford, and Chapone. They were all bad areas. Chapone was really bad, and that was way further south. Uh, we lost a helicopter around Chapone in June of uh, '70. The whole crew went went in. Um, and that the, on Wolf Zero Six, that first day I flew, around 11 hours. You know, and it's. That's a, that's a long time for we you know we are refueled, but you're just drained when you get when you get done. You know. Can you tell us how that SAR mission went when you went in on Wolf Zero Six? The uh, the the one the one that went in the, the, I showed you the picture of mm -hmm. there that was a Wolf he was on Wolf Zero Six and the, um, the second day late in the second day they finally went in and picked the guy up, uh, the, but the hoist operator on the, on the first day, he, the guy came running out toward the penetrator and he said he saw the guy, he saw him grab the, the enemy grab the uh, survivor. And that, so they knew he, they weren't gonna get him back. And then the second guy, he stayed uh, undercover until uh, I think it was late in the day when they finally went in there and got him. Because they, the, 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 uh, SAR effort there had the resources. They'd have fighters stacked up to twenty, maybe twenty-five thousand feet, waiting to cycle in there when they were when they were uh, trying to get this guy out. I mean, all you know, all effort would be made to, to you know to get him out. And but uh, you know, we'd orbit in the afternoons. We just, uh, we were on alert at NKP for for two days, and then on the third day at about three o'clock in the afternoon, we'd go orbit. And uh, the idea was to uh, be there and get the guy before they had a chance to surround him, because their goal was to bring down as many aircraft as they could. And they knew that rescue and the support aircraft coming in to help that rescue would be more aircraft to shoot down. And so generally, they kept the guy there as a trap. That was the tactic um, that evolved. From the the early days, we we found out uh, as the rescues would mm. proceed, they didn't orbit as much. Right, they were just launching. Yeah, and that's what did they tell me? Thirty minutes from NKP to uh, yeah, thirty minutes from NKP to McGee Pass. You know, that's thirty minutes for a whole lot of guys with guns yeah, to get yeah, set up. Right, yeah, and oh, even yeah. before you could start operating. So if you were there, um, I think they said that the uh, recovery rate was. If, if, if they were picked up in the first hour, you yep. were close to 80 percent yep. recovery. Mm -hmm. But yeah. anything after that became a real battle. Yeah, yeah, the longer the guy was on the ground, the more difficult it was going to get to get him out. And then you wind up into the multiple air, multiple aircraft shot down so yeah. scenario where whoever goes down on the ground last is picked up first. Again, yes. going with that, yes. yeah. they're not prepared. Yeah. You know, the, that the that happened on Laredo mission I was on. That was in April. April the 5th or 6th of 70, F-4. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, he uh, we, he got shot down in about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. He was a fast fact, but he was on route, you know, making airstrikes on truck parks along Route 7, which was from uh, uh, the F Fisher's Mouth or Bartholomew Pass over to the PDJ, PDJ the, being the plane of jars. And... Uh, during a wet and dry season, they would uh, that would seesaw back and forth. North Vietnamese would try to to um, take advantage of the of the you know the wet season, and of course, April would be the start of, of the wet season uh, when the monsoons would start moving in. Well, anyway, he got he was at six thousand feet. He pulled off a strike. He made a, he made a pass, and then as he was going through. 6,000 feet, he got hit by a 37 millimeter, and they bailed out. And so now we have, and of course, when they bail out, you hear these beepers going off. You know, it's a, it's over guard, so you can't shut it off. You know, it's, it's there. And um, so they they got a rescue effort going. Sandy's went up there to locate the, the guys that were on the ground, and uh, one of those Sandy's got shot down. 
so now they got three people on the ground and, and so the rescue helicopters that were up there they uh, made the res they rescued the sandy pilot after sunset because the guy i talked to said they were nighttime rescue it was dark you know so they they, they picked him up so then the next morning they're going to have a first light the next morning to uh make an all-out effort to get these guys and they you know they told them to bed down for the night you know and so uh we uh i was home alert that next day i was home alert low bird but the the first lighters were the north alert they took off first they took off at daybreak so they were up there when the a1s they were all up there and they were trying to prep the area and uh, they launched us about 10 o'clock in the morning and then we, we orbited up there there were four of our four helicopters up there so when then, you say prep the area yeah the a1s would would uh, be working the area to locate enemy guns and aircraft guns uh, troop concentration stuff like that their tactic was to go in and go low and slow yeah. and get them to shoot at them yeah find out where the, to locate where these guns are yeah that way they could know who they were where they were yes. and they could neutralize any threat hopefully right yeah or you know and the and the ob 10s uh, generally were they were uh, target markers so to speak they they had these rockets that they could uh, fire on the usually they were like Willie P or something like that where you really see where the locate where the gun was and those guys are pretty good their call sign was nail and so the uh, nails and the A1s up, up there working prepping the area and then uh, they put us primary at 12 o'clock and the other crew they uh, I don't know if they RT beat them or what they might have just stayed up there anyway we uh, we were orbiting, we were refueled. Then about 2.15 or so in the afternoon, the A1 said, well, I think we can go in there and get him, try to get him now, you know. And, and uh, they, they said they had one had one gun left. They couldn't get that gun to come up, you know. So uh, the A1 guy, he came up on uh, company frequency, which was FM. And between our aircraft commander and Sandy, they talked things over. And they said, uh, he said he could get this guy. He just had to, you know, get him to come up, you know. And so we decided we'll go ahead and go on in there. So we, at about 2.17, we started our ingress. And uh, we were 170 knots full speed, you know, going up this stream valley. And uh, we came up on the, the A1. I could hear him. He said... Uh, told us to kill off our airspeed and when he when he said that I, that's when I kicked the penetrator out the door and started the hoist going down and, and I saw the smoke right away of course the pilot he loses you know he loses sight of the guy from about 200 feet out or so so I started giving him hover instructions you know the the distance to the survivor and and um, I had a hoist going down full speed which is 200 feet a minute and I had uh, the hoist landed right at the guy's feet all he had to do was bend over, pick it up, put the strap on, and I started yanking him up. And uh, and as he was coming up, our co-pilot saw the other smoke off to about the 10, 11 o'clock position, about a quarter of a mile away or so. And so while we were hover taxiing over there, I was bringing the guy, the, the front seater, which is uh, Alpha, brought him up, got him in the cabin, and then uh, made a... I saw the smoke start giving hover instructions and uh, as we were coming over the smoke I saw these uh, out of my peripheral vision I saw these hands moving and I th initially I thought it was a bad guy you know because yeah. he, he's up here and I'm, the smoke is down here you know I'm looking at the smoke <laughs> you know when you said you saw the hands moving in our conversation earlier, you're describing how hard it was to see someone oh yeah he, he's got the, he's got the old the green flight suit on you know or the tiger stripes a lot of them wore them you know yeah that's all you can see because of the of the foliage that he was in so all you saw were some hands, hands at first yeah. and, and I, then what happened from that well point? i thought it was, i thought the guy was getting ready to pull his you know pull an ak-47 and getting ready to hose us down you know and then i looked closer and i said no that's the guy what's he 
why is there smoke down here and he's up there? He must have thrown a he must have thrown a smoke, a good seventy five to one hundred feet, and and he had to, he threw it downhill because he was uphill from where the smoke was, you know. So I ran the hoist down to him and got him on the hoist, and as he was coming up on the hoist, the pilot did a pedal turn to the left and swung the nose around, and I was still bringing him up on the hoist while we were making our egress. I got him in the door and I. Uh, you know, turn put my gun back in place, and I started hosing down the the uh, ridge lines along our egress route to keep heads down and all that. You know, and it took us uh, from the time we went in till the time we came out. It was ten minutes. The egress started ten seventeen. Our we egressed at ten twenty seven or uh, two twenty seven. So yeah, it, it, it but it seems longer than that because I was gonna say that ten minutes has got to feel like yeah when your adrenaline's going everything slows yeah, down yeah, a little everything bit everything slows your thinking process increases your reflexes everything you know and um, anyway we uh, we headed back and the OV tents and A ones and helicopter all formation flying back to Udorn you know and so because he's these F-4 pilots there are from Udorn, a triple nickel. And um, we landed at Udorn there, and of course they had a big reception going there, and I got to talking to one of the guys that was orbiting while we went in. I, he's my hybrid on, on uh, our flight. He said, did you see that, did you see that 37 shooting at you? And I said, no, I didn't see no 37. He said, yeah. He, he got about four or five air bursts off before that A1 uh, nailed him, you know. So they were just waiting for him to open up. Yeah. They knew he was there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I said, I says, how, I says, how close was he getting? He said, well, if you had another three or four shots off, he'd have got you. Yeah. You know, but he said there was air bursts, you know, following us in. The, uh, the combination of the, uh, the, uh, Broncos, the and and the Sky Raiders, and and the Jollies, they made a, a fa fantastic team. Oh yeah, for yeah. rescues. Oh yeah. You had your spotter, yeah. and you had the uh, yeah. A1 to go in and just muscle the area. Yeah. They, they could take a lot of abuse. Oh yeah. And yeah. then you guys could move very quickly and efficiently. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, one time, the nice thing about the A1 is he he could fly right with you. You know, and there were times when they would they would just lead the helicopter right to where the guy was. Helicopter, they wanted to be up front, and, they, and the helicopter would be behind them. You know, and, and our, our normal, our, on H-53, our ingress speed was 170 knots, which A-1 could easily do, you know. Mm -hmm. The H-3s, I don't, the H-3s had a slower ingress, you know, airspeed, but uh, when, you, when you had to use it, it you could use it. You know. Didn't you tell me a story about how an A1 pilot came up right next to you and your pilot kept slowing down, slowing down? Oh, so yeah. We, we were on the... Now, let's have a little bit of fun here and talk about, you know, yeah. young guys with expensive aircraft having a little bit of fun at somebody else, you know, with yeah, somebody else. but I think a lot of it was see how, how skillful they were. Yeah. You know, because you got a balance that airplane. <laughs> a loaded airplane out there at that altitude at that airspeed. It's, Why don't you tell me that story? Tell me how that went. Yeah, yeah, yeah we uh, it, when we orbited up there, it was a it was a race track pattern orbit, about a hundred miles long or so, and it got boring. There were times when A ones were off doing their own thing, and and we'd be up there just you know orbiting. Yep, yeah, kind of on a south southerly heading. It was west, just west of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. There was, we call it rooster tails, it was a ridge of mountains between where we were orbiting on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Anyway, we'd, uh, we'd orbit there, take off out of NKP and climbed over 10,000 by the time we got to the Mekong. And then we'd head to the orbit altitudes and we'd be, uh, like I say, it got awful boring. And, uh, and like the A1s often would come up there and fly with us, you know. And, they take pictures of us. We take pictures of them, you know. And and the one day this guy came up there and asked us how fast we were flying. We said, "Well, we do about 110, of course, it was our orbit speed." And uh, so he said, "Well, he said, see, I hang here with you, you know." So 
we beat the, the heat of the pile. My AC beat the back 105 knots, and A1 was hanging there with us, and he, he dropped his flaps down a little bit. And now he's got a full combat <laughs> yeah, load. Yeah, he's so got a full heavy. sandy load out of So yeah, he's heavy, you know. And, and so we're flying along there, and then he, uh, our aircraft commander beat the back 100 knots, you know, and the flaps come down further, you know, and, and uh, he's marching along there, and uh, and he beat the back to 95 knots, and I mean, this thing is just really starting to stagger, you know, and the gear, landing gear comes out, he's just creating all kinds of drag there to try to stay slow as we can, we were, you know, and, and then our pilot, he just kind of rolled back to the left, you know, and. When the A1 started, I mean, he just stalled out and <laughs> down he went. And we watched him as he went down there and, and against the against the jungle foliage, you, he was kind of hard to see, but when those wingtip vortices, you know, as he was pulling out, you can see those wingtip vortices, they're white, you know, because <laughs> of the condensation there. And then he'd disappear for about 10, 15 minutes here. He'd come up there again, he'd be flying with us, you know. So it was just something to break the monotony of the of the uh, of the you know, orbiting you know at, uh, and then about six and a, six o'clock or so they'd RTB us you know and one day we were up there and this is north orbit and uh, we uh, they told us to go ahead and RTB because of the frag missions were over now, what is a frag? Frag is an airstrike, a, 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 a scheduled airstrike, and they call them frag, frag missions. You know, so and, it's a planned uh, mission. Yeah, it's a planned strike mission. Okay. And, and so we orbited up there while they were going on, and and so we we headed back, and we heard over our radio, uh, a one pilot said, "Hey, he said, look, he says I found something here, you know." And they went, got to looking over there, and it's uh, helicopters. That's their hell, not ours. It was a Russian hind, a Russian um, a Mel Eight, I think it was. But it, anyway, they used them up there and flew them into Laos to resupply the North Vietnamese that were there. And uh, we, so we kept listening to him, and he called. Uh, I don't know if it was Brigham, who, who was a airborne command post. To, you know that he wanted to strike and. They want to use their dump their ordnance on these what they found there helicopters there, and, and um, they they call back and said, "Well, stand by one. We'll check to make sure there no friendlies in that area." And then so they waited and waited, and, and the A ones were orbiting off in the distance away from that because they didn't want to tip their hand, you know. And so they uh, kept calling uh, Brigham to see if they could make the clearance to go ahead and make the strike, you know. And, and uh, they hadn't gotten permission or clearance to do it yet, you know. And they said, hey, you better hurry up. We're getting low on fuel. And then they're going to say, well, if you're that low fuel, RTB. And they said, because I go to RTB. He said, I'm going to get these. You know, so uh, he uh, he finally, they finally gave him permission to go ahead. And the A1s wasted their, dumped all their ordnance and all that on the, on the, uh, Helicopter that I guess they were resupplying with fuel and now is that in northern Laos for you? Northern saw? Laos, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Brief history lesson: a lot of folks don't understand why we were operating in Laos. Uh, well, they're, they're not, Laos was neutral, but the 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 idea was that there would be no North Vietnamese or U.S. forces. It would be just the path of Laos, which was communist Laos and the Royal Laos. And, you know, they, they would be doing the fighting, you know, and of course Air America was up there to help the Royal Laotians, you know, but as far as the, you know, U.S. military that, uh, well, the North Vietnamese, they didn't, they didn't go by that treaty or nothing. They, they, uh, they had hundreds of thousands of troops in, in Laos there, you know, and so they, uh, we, we took advantage, you know, because of that, then we, we made our airstrikes. You were committed to it. Yeah. In fact, on our helicopters around the Star Insignias, they had this uh, sheet metal slots, on two on the side, one on the bottom, and one that when we landed in, at any Lima site up there, we'd uh, 
the one crew member would run out there with these camouflage colored plates, aluminum sheet plates, and drop them over the, into that tray there, which covered the American insignia. So they say that they're not American, but on the back tail it said USAF tail number, <laughs> you know, so, but the, but the, 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 the insignia was red, white, and blue on a, on a camouflage fuselage, which kind of stood out, you know, so. But yeah, they, uh, there was there was as much fighting, and, or more. There were probably more bombing, you know, airstrikes air in Laos than there was in South Vietnam. You know, the, because that, we were supporting. Yeah, after the bombing halt of North Vietnam, most most of the bombings were in Laos, on the on the Route Seven structure and then the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Crossed over the Ho Chi Minh Trail one time and looked like the surface of the moon. There are no trees, nothing left. They just, just during the dry season. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've seen pictures, and uh, when you see pictures today, it looks like thousands of fish ponds. Oh yeah. It, it looks like you know it yeah. looks like an agricultural fish yeah. pond. You know, yeah. and and it's just well a, a seven hundred a seven hundred fifty pound bomb landing in some of that soil there dug a hole fifty feet deep, and. Uh, in fact, the North Vietnamese, what they did is they would, they would use those bomb craters as uh, storage, s storage uh, cam and they camouflage them over. They put, they put their ordnance that was being moved down the trail, into these bomb craters and cover them up. You know, so they couldn't be seen. And when I was at Da Nang, I was looking west one night. And it was after about nine o'clock at night, and, and I thought a thunderstorm. I saw all this flashing going on over there. And I thought, man, what, they're having a thunderstorm over there, you know, but you couldn't hear anything. You just saw the the flashes, you know. And that was about 9 o'clock at night. Well, about midnight, it's still going on. I said, man, I ain't no thunderstorm. I mean, that thunderstorm don't last that long, except that it was a little bit further north. And I thought, thunderstorm would move faster than that, you know. And about 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning, it was further north. And I found out a couple of days later that AC-130 had put a 105 millimeter round into one of them craters. Started a chain reaction of uh, 600 explosions and fires and everything going on, just chain reaction going up the, you know, that, and that was in 72 when the Easter Offensive hit, you know, so they, they uh, That's when it heated up really oh, yeah, bad. Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, one, one morning we had a, I forget what, I guess it was in April or May, but, you know, after the Easter offensive started that five or six VNAF C-130s taxied into our revetments where our helicopters were, you know, and they sat there for, I don't know how long, three, four hours, you know, then they, here, here come these here D-6 cat little boys, you know, carried a, probably carried a D-6 cat, Mm -hmm. Each one of them had a 15,000 pound bomb on it. And they, they put 12 foot extenders on these bombs. The big daisy cutters. Yeah. And they, when they, when they hauled them up north, because when they blew the bridges to stop the armor from coming south, there were sitting ducks up there. Mm -hmm. And they, they dropped these daisy cutters right on top. You know, and that, uh, it's a devastating blast. You know, so. Yeah, they're monsters. You had talked to me a little bit about um, the Sante raid and your involvement. Yeah, we uh, as far as sterilizing aircraft. Can can we go through that a little bit? Yeah. You just in in June, uh, some of our pilots that we had left went back to the states and TDY just disappeared. Yeah, which is kind of unusual, but we thought they, you know, our commander, they thought they went back for NRS training, not recovery system training. We were getting our helicopters in that uh, had night recovery systems on them to do rescues at night because the the uh, daylight missions were getting so hazardous, you know. And so that's where we thought they went, you know. And, and then I guess in October, they, they were still gone, you know. And, and then October... Uh, we got a directive to stop flying the C models. You know, and of course, for training missions, we had to use the B models, which we did. We, we didn't like those B models because you, you couldn't go in with a full load of fuel, you know. So anyway, 
crews complained about you having a big train with B models, you know, so we did that. And then one of our pilots, a uh, guy that I flew with a lot, he said, there's something going on. And uh, he says, uh, and he, he mentioned to me, he said, he thought it would be a POW raid in Laos. Because they, they, they knew there was a POW being held by the communist Laotians. And, well, our commander, he went on R&R, &R, but then he went back to the States. He was from, I guess his family lived in Montgomery. And he started asking about his, when he's going to get his pilots back. And that night, the FBI was knocking on his door and said, do you either can go with us now or you can leave tomorrow morning and go back to Southeast Asia. And they were using his helicopter, his crew, he knew nothing about it. And I was, you know, it was that, it was that compartmentalized. Well, anyway, November, I had a mission on the 14th of November in, in country. And we had this guy, three Americans had been in an accident with a log, a Thai log truck. And two of them were killed and one of them had a severe head injury. So we had to fly down to Roy at Thailand. We left about seven o'clock in the morning and sat on the ground for I don't know how long waiting for them to bring the, the, the two bodies and the survivor, you know, there to... And then finally about noon or so, was uh, maybe even in the afternoon, they finally got... And then we loaded them up and we took off. It was just us, just one helicopter. There was King, we had King orbiting, you know, but... And we... Uh, you had to fly him to a hospital in Bangkok. And the flight surgeon we had on board said, you don't go over 700 feet. He said, because he's got the severe head injury, he wouldn't survive. So we flew 700 feet all the way from Royette, Thailand to Bangkok. Um, Royette sits between Yubon and Yudorn, about halfway. And so we flew down there, and of course we had no idea where this place was. And, they, they, there was one of the GCA guys at Dong Mong who knew, Bangkok knew where this place was. So he was giving our pilot the instructions to which street to come up and which one and when to turn and all, because he had us on radar, you know. And so we finally found the place and then we landed there in the ambulance. We landed in the soccer field right along the middle of the main highway going southeast out of Bangkok. And then we, um, they picked the, the survivor, took him to the hospital, but then we had to wait for them to pick the two bodies up. And we must have been there five, six hours just waiting, you know. And then finally they come, and by then it was starting to, the sun was starting to go down. And, and we, uh, so we took off and flew to Dong Mong, which is an airport there in Bangkok, and took, refueled the helicopters and uh, refueled that one helicopter there we had. And I had to service the service to tear reservoir because it was low and and they said well we're going to spend the night here and uh, they said your your crew duty your crew duty is waived get that helicopter back here at night you know here we are about 11 o'clock at night and we're dog tired and so we took off <coughs> went back flew back to you know and landed there at two and a, two o'clock in the morning and uh because we had a c model so anyway Several days later, a couple of other crew members disappeared, you know, and they, they, they were taken, they went to Tok Lee, I guess it's some of our pararescue guys, and they went to Tok Lee. And so we, afternoon about five o'clock, they called us down to operations and they handed me this slip of paper. There was five helicopters. And they said, they gave an itemized list as to what to do. We sterilized the helicopters. We uh, Uploaded 18,000 rounds of ammunition on two of the birds. Um, That's about twice what you load. Twice the load, yeah. We carried normally 9,000 rounds. We had 18,000 rounds. And then uh, we had to cut and cap the wires of lights, exterior lights that couldn't be turned off with a switch. And then they said, stand, you know, they told us just to stand by. And so when you sterilize an aircraft, uh, you, you, the law, when, when the, the um, total data, weight and balance, you don't, none of the uh, location information is, make sure it's not on there, the unit location, all that stuff. 
And you strip it down so that yeah, it yeah. doesn't lead back to anything. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, the, 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 the Thailand didn't want the raid emitting from there. You know, they, they, they put them in, a, I don't know, there's dipl something, diplomatic, diplomatic reasons, yes. you know, there. So anyway, about 9 o'clock, here comes C-130 in there, and here's all these guys that have been gone, and I knew quite a few of the guys. In fact, the guy that came to my helicopter was uh, my sponsor when I got to Edo, and he left after I got there, and he he came over to the, hel the helicopter I was had prepared, and I asked him, I said, uh, Dave, I says, what's going on? He said, well, he says, I can't tell you. He says, but it'll be international headlines tomorrow morning is what he told me. <laughs> yeah. They had night vision equipment. I mean, they had everything. And then about 11 o'clock, here come another C-130, and that was Bull Simmons and his green, 57 Green Berets, I think it was. They got off and went to their respective helicopters. Uh, the H, they had one H-3 there from Da Nang. They had two of them there, and they raced. You know, they raced them, and then they picked the faster of the two. And the other one went back to uh, Da Nang. And then they, these guys, I saw them calling over the helicopter. They had white coveralls on, you know, and they were uh, doing something to the helicopter. We couldn't see what they were doing. And once they got done, they put, they put an armed guard on that helicopter. And uh, that was the one that was going to crash into the compound. And what they, what the, what the guys in the white coveralls were doing was they were putting C4 in the dry bay between the four and a half fuel cells. So that they, they really, weren't yeah, going to leave that behind. They yeah. were going to crash it. Now it was going to go in because it was a, uh, they'd been um, practicing on a compound here in the U.S. Yeah. yeah. That was an identical yeah. Uh, yeah. Of the POW camp. And, yeah, exactly. And then, and then Bull Simmons had said, I, he says, uh, I'm not going to okay the, this uh, raid until the POW places don't have a single round in them, and it didn't take them long to do that. They were they were good. They they took out the buildings they were supposed to take out, you know. And so, uh, unfortunately, we got there. Yeah, and the they were already gone. Moved. And it wasn't because they found out about it. It was because the uh, monsoon was. They seeded the clouds for that monsoon season up there, and it just it flooded everything, and the river overflowed in uh, August or September. And they, they moved them out of there sometime in August, I think it was. Yeah, they'd been gone a couple of weeks, wasn't it? Yeah. Or they, was it a month? Well, they, they moved them in August, and the raid took place in November. Okay, so so they had been empty for for about th two, three months. You okay. know? And so uh, when they when they H3 taxied out, they have the flight engineer tossed the logbook to the <laughs> guy mechanic that was steady. He said, we're not going to need this no more. Of course, you never flew the aircraft without a logbook, but in this case, you know, it wasn't mm -hmm. coming back. Um, now, the mission itself was a great mission. Everybody did what they were supposed to. Had yeah. the prisoners been there, it would have been a great success. Them. Yeah, they would have gotten. In fact, there was one error that happened to be a stroke, a stroke of good luck because one of the helicopters landed Bull Simmons and his crew at the wrong compound. There was a there was a training center about 400 meters from Sante, and they landed the hel helicopter landed them there instead of over at Sante, and then they realized their mistake. But they uh, the those Green Berets that were there they wiped out a bunch of them. In fact, uh, one of them got a uh, belt buckle from one of the North Vietnamese. Or they were he said they were Chinese that were in that that camp. You know and Helicopter came in and picked them up again, and they went over there. And the the, the uh, gunship helicopters they took out the guard towers and the, the command building where the where the uh, guards and that stayed. And, and uh, then they, they landed over on a river on an island on a river and sat there and waited for the raid to finish up. And they, they were on the ground 22 minutes. And, they took some heavy resistance on the way out. I know there was a lot of SAMs. Yeah, there were a lot of SAMs, and uh, the one of the F-105 Wild Weasels got hit. And they bailed out over northern Laos, so one of the returning H-53s, they went over there and picked those two pilots up in the, you know, about 4 o'clock in the morning or so. Yeah. They were all back, um, they were all back on the ground by 5, 
and they, they took uh, Leroy Wright, who was the engineer on the H3, and he uh, broke his foot or ankle when they crashed into the compound. And so they rushed him over to the dispensary. You know, in there, and they were going to set his foot and put it in a cast and that. And, and uh, the hospital gets a call from uh, General, I uh, can't think of the manner, I think it was. And he said, You got to start him right there. And they said, Yeah, we got him in the operating room. I said, Get him over here at the airport now. And they said, He's in the operating room. I said, Get him over to the airport now. And they wheeled him out of the operating room and put him, uh, he was on a stretcher, on a stretcher or whatever, and run him. Because the airport, the, 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 the uh, terminal was on the other side of the airport from the base, from the base side, you know. And, they rushed him over there and put him on a C-141, and they were all gone by five, eight o'clock in the morning. Everything was gone. Really? Air crews, everything. They, they were headed back. and uh, They bring him back to the U.S.? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Huh. They were on a 141. Yeah. So, yeah, they were in and out of there just you know, like that, you know. They, they expected, I was told they were expected 20% losses on that. It wasn't one of them that, uh, so the, uh, the raid was, in a, in a way, the raid was successful because the POWs were brought into one prison compound that couldn't house that many, so they took them out of solitary, they, they were taken out of solitary confinement and uh, put in where they could mingle with each other, and that, you know, that helped a lot. Yeah, probably helped with morale for oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Now, didn't you uh, say that when we met earlier, you were chatting about a friend of yours that had been shot down and captured. Uh, he was uh, one of the rescue pilots as well, wasn't he? A uh, helicopter pilot? Yeah, there, there, well, there were two of them. Well, one, one of, the, one of them was a shot down was an H-43, and the, that crew was captured. The other one that was shot down was an H-3 out of NKP, and um, they, they got hit, and the Aircraft caught fire. The pilot, co-pilot, and the PJ, because they carried a pilot, co-pilot, PJ, and a f flight mac, and they all, you know, they were given the order to bail out. They were over in North Vietnam, and uh, the engineer, he, he bailed out, but he forgot to unhook his gunner's belt. So there he is, hanging below the helicopters, with hanging from his gunner's belt, you know, and took him a bit, but he got it. He finally got the gunner's belt released, and then he fell away from the helicopter, you know. Well, that was flying and burning still. Yeah, it was on autopilot, but it was still flying, and it was a, his belly was on fire, and, and uh, he was the only one that wasn't captured, because he was staying with the aircraft long enough, it, it, he landed on a ridge line, and the other three landed in a, in a low valley area, and where the, pop, you know, where the, People lived, and and uh, he got rescued. The Navy rescued him that night, and took him back out to the Seventh Fleet. And, you know, they were they were kind of uh, Navy was kind of appalled that the, he didn't have a strobe or nothing. No, <laughs> he, he say he signaled him with a cigarette lighter. It's a good thing he smoked. You know, <laughs> so it was just one of those things. You know. And, didn't have a whole lot on me when I left the plane, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. But, oh, my um, goodness. Yeah. And then most of the guys that got captured, I think they said the PJ evaded for nine days, and he was captured trying to get access to water. Yeah. And because they, they knew to watch the streams and all that stuff. To, for You know, they knew that there were guys down there. The pilot co-pilot got captured pretty quick, and then, the PJ didn't get captured right away, and so the and the engineer like he, he went back to Thailand, you know. So he's back on a bird in a few days, yeah. probably going right back at it. Yeah, yeah. Now, did you ever have any close calls where you thought you were going to wind up having to bail out? One time, we were out of uh, it was an afternoon orbit over Steel Tiger. Got all the way down to the southern end, which is near the Bolivian Plateau, you know, and, and I. I noticed the transmission oil pressure fluctuated a little bit, you know. So I, I kind of kept my eye on it a little bit. After several more minutes, it fluctuated again, you know. It, it 
that's that's unusual, you know. So then I noticed every time it fluctuated, it would drop the PSI or so. So I told the aircraft commander, I said, I said we better get back, head back. I said, uh, our gearbox tr transmission oil pressure is fluctuating. And so, uh, you know, we turned around and called Kane and told him what our issue was. And he said, our transmission oil pressure is dropping, you know. So we had to stay above 10,000, man. I, man, I, put, I normally didn't fly with my parachute on, but when, that, when I saw that gearbox fluctuating, I put my parachute on, and I, was, and I kept an eye on the, and then, like I said, pressure kept dropping. I kept watching the temperature, and the gearbox oil temperature was going up. And that's a classic sign of a gearbox failure. And so if, if I saw the torque start going up, which meant that it was taking more power to drive that rotor system because the gearbox was freezing up, I was going to, I was getting ready to bail out if that happened, you know. And, we finally got across the river and we started a descent, you know, and we didn't, we didn't make a, we made a running landing. Just put it on the wheels on the runway and taxied off in the first taxiway and our you know, pressure was like five PSI left. The temperature was way up there, you know, the, that gearbox failure, you know. But yeah, I was prepared to bail out then if that the year, because once, once that gearbox fails up, your rotor starts slowing and then you stall out and, and Aircraft goes out of you know you fall like a rock mm -hmm. you know you can't even auto rotate you know so uh, about but that was the only time you know so you, yeah you had to be prepared for <laughs> everything you know and um, I had a they made a movie of uh, one of the F one hundred five pilots being shot down over there and made a movie of the rescue mission that was it and the film crew was there in June. And, the, and at noon, they went to lunch, and, and all their f film gear and the cameras and all that were laying out there in the front patio of the, of the alert building. And, and I'm way in the back across the road at the mess hall. I'm having, I'm having my noon meal. <laughs> well, they had a PA system over there, and if you scrambled, they'd say, scramble the North Crew. That's all they said. And I'm, I just had sat down and got ready to eat, and they said, scramble the North Crew. Man, I jumped up and crossed the road and into the, uh, run into the south end of the, uh, or alert building there, run all the way through and, I, and, I, and I'm running full blast. And I'm through the door and right there in front of me is all this camera equipment. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I leaped over it and landed on it. There's about four steps there going down there, all their gears. And I just leaped over that and took off running over to the helicopter and the uh, pilot and the co-pilot they were they were getting the information on the, on the what, what was what happened and so I got on the helicopter I started I started the APU up and got got the generators on the line so that when they got there and strapped in we were ready to crank engines you know so uh, we were airborne within five minutes and we were headed north and, and a high bird is a, a major that said he said, I got a C model here. My aircraft commander said, We got a C model too. So I'm a low bird. So we were going to be the first to go in. And well, anyway, we went up. It was on the PDJ. The OV 10 had gone down. And uh, uh, we could hear what was going on. Some A 1s got hit. And uh, Air America tried uh, two helicopters to go in there, and they both got shot out. And, so we figured, well, we're going to have a contested pickup here. <coughs> so the A1s worked the area over, and, and uh, we saw the where it was going on, where they were laying the strikes in. And this OV-10 pilot, he landed on a right at the very top of a ridge line. There were there was a uh, east-west ridge line, and then off of that ridge line was one, two, three, four ridge lines going south. He was on the third one at the very, about a 4,000 foot level, uh, above, you know, above sea level. And so when they cleared us in, what they did is they laid some smoke between the third and the fourth ridge line. And then we came in from the east, passed over the first and second ridge line, got to the third ridge line. Of, he did a hard left turn. And I looked out and there he was. He was about 100 feet below us. And I already had the hoist going down and I ran the hoist down to him and 
he was he was in this tall elephant grass. I mean, it was just there were no trees, just this real thick uh, elephant grass, you know. Which and so he finally got him strapped in, and I started bringing him up. And uh, I, I heard the number one minigun going off, you know, while I'm working the hoist. And uh, my number one PJ, he saw the flashes from the second ridge line, and so he he fired his minigun over at that where that ground fire was coming from. And, and as I was bringing the hoist up, the, the autopilot had a, uh, one of the amplifiers failed. And it caused a helicopter, it was a roll amplifier, so the helicopter went like this until they got it stopped. Well, when that happens, the, the hoist starts doing this. And if you're bringing a hoist up while it's doing this, it gets, it just, the pendulum action increases as you're bringing them up. So I had to stop the hoist and when he went this way, I had to push the opposite way. When he went this way, I had to pull. So you had I got to mellow it out. I got to dampen out, and I finally brought him up, you know. And, and then um, I uh, got him on board, and I put my mini gun in place. And I, and we were because we we had dumped our nose, and we were going like this, banking in a descending bank left turn. And I was going to hose this ridge line down over here. And all of a sudden, my gun jammed. My gun just stopped. And when the mini gun, when you release the trigger, the mini gun empties itself. It, it spits out any live rounds into the. Well, this one here just stopped dead. You know, no matter. And had that mini gun had no sooner stopped, and an A1 filled up my doorway with his wingspan, because we were like this, and he came across like this, and he 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 let go of salvo of. Uh, Rockets, you know, and uh, if that gun wouldn't have jammed at just at that split second, he, I mean, he he was there just as soon as the gun started, you know, and um, you'd have filled him up. Oh yeah, I would just, you know, because I just, he just flown right through my uh, my line of fire, you know. And I thought I thought about that a lot, and I says, you know, <laughs> there, he's looking out for us, yep. <laughs> you know. Um, one of your other comical things that we chatted about was an A1 pulling up next to you, a single seat fighter, and he was introducing his new co-pilot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he pulled up alongside us, and he said, what do you think of my new co-pilot? We all looked over there, and it was a stuffed dummy of Snoopy. This is an H model. It wasn't, it wasn't an E model that had the side-by-side -side seat. It was a yeah, single seat fighter, yeah, so he had that Snoopy. Was Snoopy. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't. You no mistake, it was Snoopy. <laughs> we got a laugh out of it. In fact, that one picture I gave you, I, you look close enough, that guy has got, we were wearing a leather helmet with goggles. And they, some of the guys did that out there. That was in what, 1970? 1970, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I put that out on SpadNet, see, and I, there was a lot of other things going on, oh, so yeah. I don't think it got traction, but we're yeah. going to throw a shout out to the guys and see if anybody knows who that was, yeah. you know? Yeah. That, that Where do you think you were when you were flying? It, it was that when that Steel picture Tiger? was there. Yeah, that was a barrel roll. That barrel. was up, yeah, that was up in northern Laos, and it was about it was in February of seventy. Mm -hmm. And you can see the T, the, the tail number, the TC yeah. or the TS or whatever. You yeah. can see that real plain on that. Yeah. So yeah, if somebody recognizes that, they might uh, track that down. Yeah, they might find who that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, we had a we had a good uh, working relationship with the Sandy's Sandy guys, and there were times we picked up uh, a Sandy guy. I was at alert on Ubon in August of '70, and uh, we got scrambled from uh, Ubon, but NKP was a primary, and we were sent up as secondary, and uh, yeah, and then the H3s out of the name were up there. Because this was further south on the Ho Chi Minh Trail than than uh, what uh, McGee Pass was, mm -hmm. and uh, this uh, they wanted gone down. The Hobo I, seems to me that tell a uh, call sign Hobo Five Two, and I, I believe it was in August of '70, and he was he was down, and they were working area over there, and he uh, OV Ten was marking targets, and uh, he had a lineup of fighters at his disposal to direct where he needed them to go. We heard him send one group up uh, north of there to 
because they said there was a, a truck, a bunch of trucks coming down with troops on them, you know, so he said go up there and take them out, and, and then they, they were worked that area for a while, and um, they had one gun that was in a cave, and they were working to get, get that gun out, and because the uh, gun would come out when the slow movers came in and when the fast movers came in they'd pull the gun back in and uh, if they had it on wheels or tracks or whatever but it was in a cave in a car's cave and so the uh, uh, A1 called for a paved way and we didn't know what a paved way was we had this code book so we flipped through the code book and paved way it was a 2,000 pound laser guide bomb, but at that time it took two airplanes to aim it. The, the laser aircraft and the one that dropped the bomb, you know, and so they came in and dropped the first one. And landed right beside the cave entrance. And then they, so they brought the, dropped the second one and the second one right into the cave and just blew that whole side out, you know, and so uh, then, we, then we heard uh, H3 from Da Nang came in there and come over the ridge line, picked the guy up and went back over the ridge line, and he was gone. You know, and uh, this OB-10 guy calls up and he says, uh, these guys are still looking for him. <laughs> they don't know he's been rescued. He said, so they, they, they stuck in there real fast and got him, you know. And then we had a, we had a guy in our pair, we had a P PJ in our unit that could do good caricatures. Oh, he's an excellent caricature. He just passed away here recently. And so he made a, uh, that was supposed to be a Udorn mission, not a Da Nang mission. You know? So he, he he draws up this caricature drawing of a, a helicopter sitting there hovering, and it shows a H3 net boy coming in and cutting the cable <laughs> and grabbing the guy flying away with it. <laughs> so he, 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 had all, he drew up all kinds of, uh, caricatures of funny things that happened over there and as far as I know when he passed away he still had this big book of caricatures that and he was a, to me he was a professional caricature drawer he could because when he drew a caricature of somebody you look at it, yeah that's him yeah yeah <laughs> he drew one of uh, Colonel Mordecai who was our commander and uh, when I saw that I said yeah that's that's Colonel Mordecai I hope the family keeps that as a oh, treasure yeah, item. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's my greatest fear when, uh, you know, you, you hear somebody passed away and you start asking, what happened to their photos? What happened to their films? Yeah. And you just don't know because there are guys that have sent me films. And oh, yeah. I, I'm just in awe and, and I mean, there's no reproducing that. No. Uh -uh. And, no. uh Whenever I ship them out, I, I use a fellow down in Florida, and they'll always ask me at the, you know, FedEx, yeah. what's what's the value of this? I'm oh, like, yeah. it's priceless. Oh yeah. Don't lose it. <laughs> I'm trusting you. No. I don't yeah. want to drive to Florida, but I will if I have yeah. to. But yeah. yeah. You know, and, and um, I'm often asked about PTSD, and of course I didn't know what that was back. You know, I had no idea. You know, I, I wasn't shell shocked over there. I just, but after I got back. Even after 10 years, the, 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 the incidents would be, get further and further apart. But uh, when I initially came back, uh, man, I'd wake up in the night, two, three o'clock in the morning, and they're, you know, feeling the heat, the smells, the, the tension, uh, the, the sound. Yeah, I mean, it was so real. That I would think, what am I doing back over here? <laughs> so, you know, and and uh, but every time I had one of those incidents, you know, then I found out that as I talked about my experience over there, that these these incidents of reliving it at, at night or in a dream kept getting further and further. Now now I don't, you know, 15, 20 years now I haven't uh, I haven't had a. So talking about it really helps. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, some it. some people hold it in, and uh, that's not healthy. No. You know. um, is it? Do you find it easier to talk to veterans or to just? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I find uh, 
I, I usually don't talk to a non-veteran about it unless I'm asked, you know. Or because uh, I met Rolf in Charlotte there, and he was in the aviation magazine section of uh, Barnes and Noble, and we got to talking, you know. And, and um, now Rolf is our buddy, our joint buddy that put us together. Oh yeah, he, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But he's talked, he's interviewed some interesting people over his uh, mm -hmm. time of. Uh, I mean, he's Scott Crossfield and a lot of uh, U.S. and, and German uh, World War Two aces. He, he's got these interviews on on. Uh, tape you know and so he, that and it, one of his hobbies is to build model airplanes of aircraft of, that others like when we were at a Jolly Green Union he had a model of an H-53 and I pointed out to different guys on the Sante raid that and they he would have them sign his that helicopter on the bottom you know and, that, and he's got a bunch of uh, uh, signatures from actual crew members that were on the Sante raid he was doing the same thing when we were down in uh, San Antonio. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. He was there with uh, three of the South Vietnamese yes. pilots, yep. mm -hmm. which were absolutely amazing to oh, me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you were there, how many years were you in the service? At 21. Okay, yeah. how many would you say you were in combat? Just two. Two. Two years. Those gentlemen, when I sat down and started talking to them, they, they, they've been flying 10 years in combat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they were dedicated to the cause of trying yeah. to keep the communists from invading the oh, south. Yeah. When we get into the political structure of things, there's good and there's evil. That's what it comes down yeah. to. Yeah, and people will do what they have to do to try to defend their homes. And those oh, yeah. guys fought so hard. Yes, and that became very apparent early in the interview mm -hmm. when one of the fellows opened up. Yeah, and when I asked, you know, how many flight hours they had, because most pilots oh, and most yeah. crew. Yeah. Well, I had 600 in this, I yeah. had 1,000 in this. Those guys are uncounted. They said, we quit counting it like yeah. nine, ten thousand 10,000 hours. You know, yeah. I, I, you know, he said, you know, we'd run three oh, or yeah. four missions, five missions a day. Yeah. You just go, go, go. When, when I was in northern Laos, we'd stand alert at Lima Site 20. Uh, and uh, these Laotian pilots, they didn't have to fly very far to drop their ordnance. You know, and then they had different colored nose domes on their props. Mm -hmm. So you could tell how often you'd sit there and watch them come and go, come and go. And I was there one time, and that one airplane there made six landings and six takeoffs. And each time he took off, he had a load of ordnance on him. And he'd come back, he'd be, you know, he wouldn't have anything, you know. And, and um, Bang Pao's headquarters was at that, uh, at that name of site. Yeah. And um, he was quite the warrior. Oh yeah, oh yeah, well respect, very charismatic with his men. But uh, we were up there one time and, and uh, this uh, kid is what he was. He probably couldn't have been all 13 years old and he had a grand. He, he was carrying a, he wasn't carrying, he was dragging it because the gun was bigger than he was, you know, the taller than he was. The M1 know. grand? Yeah, the M1 grand, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, one of our PJs said, uh, you're too small, you can't shoot that thing. He said, I'll shoot, you know. He took a little, kicked the bolt, and then that shot, he fired off. You know, he, he hit what he was aiming at, you know, but he, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't but that tall. And Van Powell's army was made up of those young, and that's all they'd known was is war, you know. And um, we had this one kid up there one day, <laughs> Some more guys would bring stuff up there like shoes. Of course, they couldn't wear our boots because their feet were too small, you know. But they could, they we'd supply them with you know uniforms if the best we could and stuff like that. And he, he said, I want to trade something. He wanted to trade because they had all kinds of weapons up there they'd capture, you know. And he wanted he told him what he was looking for, you know. And this one guy had a Browning nine millimeter. He took it up there and he was going to trade it with. With the, one of these Laotian kids, you figure he'd gun was wore out is what it was. And uh, he, he said he told him he wanted to trade with this one kid, you know, for another weapon, you know. And the kid takes a gun, he gives, he jacks something, locks up and looks down the barrel, no good. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, they could tell when they had a good weapon and when they had a bad weapon. He told that guy, he said, your gun's no good. He's just a little kid, <laughs> you know. But uh, our PJs would carry an extra medical bag up, I mean a big medical kit, and they would treat some of these uh, Hmong uh, boys, you know, these young kids, uh, 
uh, Vang Pao's army you know, had this one kid one day come walking through there and his foot was had wrapped in gauze, you know, or, or stripes, strips, you know. And, and they, we had a structure on the helicopter and they, they brought him in there and cleaned, you know, un, you know, unwound the wound and I mean it was all infected and that and because the kid had been walking on it, you know, and so they, they cleaned it up as best they could and tried to suture it up to where he could, you know, be able to get the thing taped up and uh, and uh, where it would heal, you know, and but yeah, these, some of these young kids, that's all they ever knew was, was war, you know. Um, it's a hard life. I mean, some of those, some of those Laotian pilots, they couldn't drive a jeep or a vehicle, but they could fly an airplane. You know, they had T-28s up there mm -hmm. out of the, the, the Long Chien, they had T-28s. And uh, it was day after day after day, especially during the dry season. Towards the end, they were trying to get them set up with uh, the flattest porters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were going to be using those, but that was right down there at 72, oh, yeah. 73 when everything was starting to unravel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's, you know, Laos is a beautiful country. You know, to, to tour that country, it's scenery is out of, out of, out of this world, you know. The, the, you go down the Bolivan Plateaus, you know, it used to be the prime tiger hunting country of the world down there in the Bolivan Plateaus. It's a plateau that rises up, I don't know, like 4,000 feet, and it's flat on top. And they've got farmland up on top, of the, but there's waterfalls all over that plateau that, you know, um, yeah, it's, uh, and gold, that, you know, at that time, our guys could go up to Vinchen Laos and get you a big old heavy-duty bracelet made bigger than this watch here in solid gold, you know, and, and a lot of guys had to, bot chains, what they call them bot chains, or it was nothing but, you know, real solid gold. And they would use those for and just decoration? Yeah. There was an A1 pilot that I've interviewed recently, mm -hmm. and he had this really nice bracelet. Yeah. And he said, you know, if you get shot down, oh, this yeah. was part of my E&E &E plan was, yeah. I can't give a guy a hundred bucks no. cash. Mm -hmm. He said, I was going to trade him the gold. He gold. said he knew that the North Vietnamese and, yeah. and the Laotians loved oh, yeah. gold. Yeah. And that was his, part of his plan was to wear that. And, yeah. You know? Yeah. And then somebody said, well, what if they just shoot you and take it? And he said, huh, I didn't think about that. So he had an, incri an inscription made on the back uh -huh. that said, if I'm laying here dead and cold and you're stealing this off my body, well, then it, it cuts the guy out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that was his thing. He was like, well, if you're going to steal it, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's what it's going to be. When I got over there, the, the, one of the things they did was you had to fill out this questionnaire. And it's questions that only you knew the answers to. That, and that was used for in case you got shot down, they would, they would authenticate you by with those questions. You had to give them the right answers. And then they, they, you had a blood chip which had several different languages of the area you were flying over in Laos because there's different, there's, I don't know how many different languages were over there, but uh, it was a promise of gold for your safe return. And they took fingernail clippings and uh, hair samples and they put it in your file, you know, to determine DNA. Your, you know, your, well, they would, they, they, they didn't have the DNA at that time, but but they could, Use that hair and the fingernail clippings to to uh, help identify, you know, you as a. Because if you get you know get burned up in an aircraft crash, why, you know, your fingernails and, would, you know, but they would. Uh, we had to turn those blood chits in. You weren't allowed to keep them. They had a serial number on the very bottom. Really. Yeah. Yep. They were controlled at them. Huh. Yeah. I had not heard of the blood chits. Oh yeah. Well, they had them in World War II. You know, pilots carried them in World War II over in the South Pacific or in the jungle, you know, China and that. They, it's just a piece of silk about that high and about DIY. And it's a, you know, I'm an American fighting and you return, I say return, promise of this much gold or whatever, you know. And that, uh, but it was in several different languages. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, different world over there at that time. Because when I, the first time I landed at Long Chan, it was like stepping back in history, 70 years, you know, the, the things were so primitive and, you know, it's, uh, 
It reminded me of Steve Canyon, you, you know, with his, with his uh, environment, you know, Steve yeah. Canyon kind of environment there, you know. When you, when you flew into Long Chien, there's a ridge line on the north and there's a ridge line on the south and you had these big cars, rock formations out in front of you, you know, and, uh, but they landed C-130s there. Uh, and the runway wasn't level. It, it, it came in like this and it went uphill a little bit, came up went like that. It, you know, it was about as level as they could make it, you know. At that time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so is there anything else that you would like to speak about and talk about your experiences with rescue and uh, the Jolly Greens? Well, the, the Jolly Green uh, call sign uh, didn't end with the end of the war, you know, because the units in the States here were went by Jolly Green uh, call signs. Uh, my tour in Alaska, we were used, when we went under. We, when I first got to Alaska, and that you know was under the 5040th, which was under the Alaskan Air Command, mm -hmm. and then in the 76, I think it was sometime in 76, late 75, the that whole unit fell under rescue, and they made it a we call it a um, composite squadron because it had it had the, the squadron had tankers and it had the helicopters going. Uh -huh. You know that we then we switch to the jolly call signs. If we could round this out, and you tell me that funny story about somebody painting jolly green footprints on a silo. On a, on a, on a water tower. Water tower. Well, right. <laughs> there there was another case of the jolly green footprints. You know, one of our command the commander of rescue was a two star general, General Allison Brooks. And at this time in 1966 or 67, they, had, they were getting their HC-130s. And he flew into Udorn one day, just as a visit, courtesy visit to the, to the, to the Air Force there and talk about rescue coverage and all that. And when he landed there at uh, Udorn, 